Hello everybody, uh, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, we're continuing in our series discussing the topic of heaven, and I believe this is part five. Uh, each of these episodes uh, last about two hours, so we've already talked for eight hours about heaven, and I, I hope that's been uh, interesting and helpful to, to you. Uh, uh, I expect that before we kind of exhaust this subject, and it'll probably take us many, many more episodes. So uh, I know that I find it very interesting, and I never get tired of talking about it and hearing about heaven. But uh, let me uh, introduce uh, the panelists, and you can say hi to everybody, then we'll get started. We'll, we'll start with Sister Tiffany. Hello, everybody. My YouTube username is Day 6 and I am very grateful to be on here and talk about heaven, somewhere that I just dream of going, and I just can't wait to experience it. So I'm very excited to speak on this topic tonight. Okay. Thank you, Tiffany. We appreciate you being here. And we got Brother Eric. Hey, Eric here. Uh, my YouTube channel is uh, Jesus Knight 72 um, Just to build on what Tiffany said a little bit, I know there are the videos, uh, you know, it seems like a, a long series, but I think if you give it some time and actually delve into these videos, it might add some perspective and some angles that you might not have considered before. So uh, before you uh, before you kind of think, ah, it's an awful long time, when it, um, give it some time and, and drop in and, and listen to what some of the things that are being said because you might find, you might be kind of surprised at some of the things you've heard. Mm -hmm. And uh, his timing is impeccable. Uh, we got Brother Mitch. We're just introducing the panelists here, Brother Mitch. Hello. And you you always like to make an, a nice um, dramatic entrance. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, it's Brother Mitch. I like to make dramatic entrances. <laughs> Man, he, he was right on time today. I mean, he came in. All right. right <laughs> I mean, he was like down to like the one second mark, perfect timing. Um, first, before we get go on to the topic here, let me just say the videos Mitch made today were really, really awesome, and not only very insightful things uh, he points he made, but I just like almost injured myself laughing so hard. <laughs> So uh, please, everybody, if you're watching this video, watch uh, Mitchell Belenkoff's videos he made today. Okay, we're going to pick up where we left off. For those of you who uh, haven't seen any of the previous uh, videos on heaven, uh, this is the fifth episode, and we're working our way through a book with the title Heaven. Uh, right here. And the author is Randy Alcorn. Is this book showing up on the screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me see. I, uh, there it is, Heaven by Randy Alcorn. And uh, we're working our way through the book, and we're discussing his viewpoints on heaven. He does a very good job citing scriptures to uh, uh, support his conclusions. We may not necessarily agree with every conclusion, but it's an interesting subject to discuss. So right now, uh, if you have the book, we're on page 68, and the, the heading says, do heaven's inhabitants remember life on earth? And it says, uh, as we've seen, the, the martyrs depicted in Revelation 6 clearly remember at least some of what happened on earth, including that they underwent great suffering. If they remember their martyrdom, there's no reason to assume they would forget other aspects of their earthly lives. In fact, we'll all likely remember much more in heaven than we do on earth and we will probably be able to see how God and angels intervened on our behalf when we didn't realize it. Well, if he's right, that not only we're, we're going to remember our lives on earth, but our memory will be enhanced and even better, <laughs> I, could, I could really use my memory being enhanced. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not as good as it used to be. So, uh, what are we talking about? <laughs> well, t let me let me refresh your memory, uh, Brother Mitch. Uh, we're talking about heaven. <laughs> heaven, yeah, that's a great subject. <laughs> so uh, he has a lot to say about memories. We're going to be getting into this, but first, just your first reaction to the idea 
And there's a lot of people uh, who I think that their their conclusion is without giving a lot of thought and without looking at the scriptures, they immediately come to the conclusion that no, we couldn't possibly remember our lives on Earth because for various reasons. So. Uh, and Randy Elkhorn says, no, we're going to have memory. So what's your first response reaction to that? I don't want to lose my identity. I mean, I know a lot of people might be upset because they had suffering in their life. But, you know, I really think that, that it'll be put into perspective in heaven in such a way where it won't hurt our past, it won't hurt us. But my, who, my, all the things that I went through are part of me. And I, I, I certainly don't want to just become born new like a baby with no memory of who I was. I mean, that would be horrible to me. Uh, when you said you don't want to lose your identity, I really believe that that would be the case. If we had no memory of who we are and were, would we really even be ourselves? I, I would have to agree with him on that. Um, you know, even though we experience good and bad throughout our lives, uh, I don't know if I would want everything erased. You know. Mhm. Mm well, obviously, uh, our life is a mixture of of um, experiences, some exhilarating and wonderful, and some just kind of average and boring, and and some painful and horrible that we'd like to forget basically yeah. uh, but I'm wondering in heaven if, if because of the, the perspective the, the bad things uh, we can remember them and it won't hurt us anymore just because we are in such a state of ecstasy our happiness and joy is so extreme that that we couldn't possibly be even phased by remembering the, the, the bad experiences that would be my guess. I think to another side of that too, and in, in agreeing with Tiffany and and with Mitch is, um, you know, it, it, it seems to me to make up to 120 years of possible life on this earth, it would make it rather pointless. I mean, what would be the point of God? Uh, and and when you consider what happens, like um. Not long ago, my grandmother passed away. She lived to be 96 years old. I consider all the things, the events that happened in her lifetime and what she saw and what she witnessed. I mean, what would be the point in the experience of life and the testing that we go through if that's simply not even going to be remembered? It just seems to, it seems completely pointless to me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, what, do, you, do you all have Bibles with you? If you do, I'm going to give each of you a verse to look up. Um, Mitch, could you look up uh, Luke 16:25? Uh, okay. Well, I was just wondering if I should lie and say I don't have my Bible. Well, you don't need one. Don't you have all the Bible memorized? Oh, of course I do. Sure. What was it? I, I, I even forgot what we were talking about. <laughs> Luke 16.25. 16. <laughs> write that down. Luke 16.25. And Eric, you, write, you uh, look up 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. And Tiffany, you look up Matthew 12.36. And uh, Randy Alcorn, in his book, he says, In heaven, those who endured bad things on earth are comforted for, for them. And he cites Luke 16, 25. This comfort implies memory of what happened. If there was no memory of the bad things, what would be the need for or nature of such comfort? So if you have Luke 16, 25... Luke uh, 16, 25. But Abraham said, Child, remember that nothing... Is that nothing? Oh, wait a minute. During your... You know, I really need my glasses. Hold on. Let me get some light on here. Okay. During your life, you received your good things, and likewise, Lazarus, bad. Thing, uh, bad things. But now, he is being... Uh, comforted here and you are in agony okay um, I don't know that particular verse I mean you could take it that way but he's really making the point that is why would there be any need for him to be comforted um, uh, if you remember some bad things 
uh, obviously, you know, you'd want someone to comfort you. I mean, if I'm if I'm thinking of something bad in my life, you know, I like to have a friend or a family or somebody there to to embrace me and cheer me up and help me get through it. And uh, so he's citing that verse as a possible explanation of why in the world would you need comforting? Well, I'm glad I'm losing my memory so I don't have to remember the bad things. <laughs> Okay, uh, now he says, after we die, we will give an account of our lives on earth down to specific actions and words. So let's see 2 Corinthians 5.10. Um, <clears throat> that reads, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Mm -hmm. And Tiffany, you got Matthew 12.36. Yes. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Mm -hmm. So uh, Randy Elkhorn is citing these verses to support the proposition uh, that uh, uh, we will have memory of every little detail. Okay, uh, he goes on to say the doctrine of eternal rewards hinges on specific acts of faithfulness done on earth that survive the believer's judgment and are brought into heaven with us. Uh, Eric, could you look up 1 Corinthians 3.14? And Mitch, you look up Revelation 19. My favorite book. Well, my second favorite book. Revelation 19, <laughs> verse 7 and 8. And Tiffany, you look up Revelation 14, verse 13. Okay. okay, he says, The doctrine of eternal rewards hinges on specific acts of faithfulness done on earth that survive the believer's judgment and are brought into heaven with us. In heaven, the bride's wedding dress stands for the righteous acts of the saints done on earth. Our righteous deeds on earth will not be forgotten, but will, quote, follow us to heaven. Uh, the positions of authority and the treasures we're granted in heaven will perpetually remind us of our life on earth. Ooh, that's an interesting point. Because what we do on earth will earn us those rewards. So let's look at those verses uh, first, uh, Eric. Uh, the 1 Corinthians 3.14 uh, says, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Now this kind of goes... Uh, in conjunction with the Second Corinthians verse I read, um, and then where Paul talks about uh, a person will store up uh, rewards if they are good or bad, uh, they'll be tested with fire, and if any of them endure, um, you know, if, if they're burned up, he himself will be saved as through the flames, but his works will be burned up. So they kind of all work together. Remember, in First Corinthians and Second Corinthians, Paul's talking to believers. He's not talking about unbelievers. So they're not talking about a judgment of deciding to go to heaven or hell. They're talking about a judgment based on works. So you're clearly going to go to heaven, and you're clearly going to understand, based on things you've done good and bad, your rewards will be either given or you will not receive rewards based on that. So clearly you will know what you've done, whether it's good or bad. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, and uh, Mitch, you got Revelation 19, verse 7 and 8? Yeah, I also have this magnifier. Let, <laughs> let us rejoice and be glad and give uh, the glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine li linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Okay. Uh, and, and then, uh, Tiffany, read yours, and then we'll kind of conclude what this is, how this is relevant. Revelation 14 and 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead, which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, said the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Okay. So he's making the conclusion from these verses. He says, The, the positions of authority and the treasures were granted in heaven will perpetually remind us of our life on earth because what we do on earth will earn us those rewards. Uh, I think it's just a logical conclusion that that 
if I have a particular crown, or if, if, if Mitch has gold or silver or something. My teeth. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if Eric has some a little wood hay and stubble. Thanks. <laughs> along with some silver and precious gems. Oh, oh sure. You know, uh, Tiffany, don't you think those those um, uh, treasures and rewards uh, that follow us in, in heaven, how could it not remind us of, of the things that we did and uh, good and bad? Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. So. Uh, I, I really like how, I mean, I, again, I, I don't think any of us on the panel or, and people watching are necessarily going to uh, agree with every conclusion, but I do like how he, he at least, he doesn't just have like some theory comes in his mind uh, from nowhere. Uh, his, his theories and conclusions are all based upon some scriptures. Okay, so he says, God keeps a record in heaven of what people do on earth, both unbelievers and believers. We know that that we know that record will outlast our life on earth for believers at least until the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, you looked up, did you look at that before that verse? Yeah, we already saw Second mm -hmm. Corinthians five ten for unbelievers right up until the great white throne judgment, Revelation twenty eleven and thirteen. Uh, uh, we looked up that one too, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Uh, 2011 through, I don't think we did 2011 yeah, through 13. Okay. Eric, you look up that one, please. Uh, just preceding the coming of the new heavens and the new earth. For for those now in heaven, those records of life on earth still exist. In chapter 32, we'll take a look at the scroll of remembrance mentioned in Malachi 3.16, which even now is being written in heaven concerning those living on the earth. Okay, I got that verse for you. Okay. Or the series of verses. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 13. Uh, and I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Okay. Um, I think it's worth taking a moment to talk about these two judgments that he's referenced here, uh, because I think a lot of people, unless they spend a lot, a lot of time studying the scriptures, they're not aware that this judgment. People always talk about someday God's going to judge them, but they don't realize that there are two distinct separate judgments for for the just and the unjust. Uh, does anybody want to uh, attempt to explain the difference between the judgment for the just and the unjust? The I can give it a try. The um you have two two separate judgment seats. One for the believer um, who's judge who is judged in righteousness because of Christ's righteousness, we're saved through Christ and then judged at the judgment seat of Christ, for which we are our salvation is not in question. It's a matter of um, judging us for rewards based on our works, good or bad. And that was what was mentioned in Corinthians to the believers, the, what is known as the judgment seat of Christ. Here in Revelation, we're speaking about the great white throne judgment. That's a different judgment. That's a judgment for um, those uh, for unbelievers who are still, uh, who never had their sins removed uh, because they never accepted Christ as their Savior. So they are they are simply um, brought before the, uh, the great white throne for judgment so that they can, it can be, their sentence can be given to them based on what they have done to show them why they're going to hell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that this basic idea of these two judgments here is really foreign to almost everybody, and, and except that tiny percentage of people who have really studied the scriptures. Uh, that uh, uh, those of us who put our faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ, we don't have to get go to the great white throne judgment uh, where uh, you get judged uh, based upon how you're going to be punished in the lake of fire. No, we, we, we bypass that because we trusted Jesus. We have eternal life promised to us in, in heaven. So now we go to this judgment seat of Christ, also called the Bema seat. Uh, and at that judgment, 
we're not judged whether we go to heaven or hell. We're already in heaven. We already have eternal life. That's settled. Now we're just judged based upon after we got saved, what did you do for Jesus? And what, you know, and, and, and he has rewards. This is what he calls treasures in heaven, that we, we, we build up treasures in heaven because of after we got saved, some people don't take it very seriously and they don't really try to witness for Jesus or, or help people or do good deeds, you know. This is one of the reasons people uh, should be doing good deeds and, and trying to grow and mature spiritually is because that judgment seat of Christ, you're going to either receive or suffer loss, that means that you're you're not going to get the rewards that you could have earned. So uh, uh, obviously uh, he's making the point here that you have a memory. If you have to give an account and you get these treasures for the things you did, then you're going to have to have a memory. It'll be a, actually a constant all through eternity. If you have treasures for eternity, wouldn't that be a constant reminder all through eternity of the good things you did? And, and 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 you know when when some of us look at uh, Sister Tiffany and we see all the rewards that she got and she got some rewards that we didn't get uh, because she, you know she just did some really good stuff that we neglected to do. Do you think we're going to be jealous? It'll be will it be a constant reminder that oh Sister Tiffany got more rewards than me? Well, maybe maybe that's why maybe that's the key. Maybe that's why people don't seem so as excited about heaven as they should. Maybe they know they're not really doing very much and they're not looking forward to very many rewards because they're not doing anything. <laughs> I'm not saying that's the case out there for anybody listening. I'm just saying maybe you want to kind of evaluate things and yeah. kind of look inside yourself and wonder why you're not excited because you know. I know that there's a lot of people that, that want to make the point that, well, I'm not doing anything to try to earn rewards. That's kind of like a selfish act. And, uh, but, uh, and that's kind of a pious attitude, I, I would say. And I, there's nothing wrong with wanting to build up our treasures in heaven and uh, working for it and having that as a goal. Uh, my primary reason for wanting to serve Jesus is just because I love Jesus and I want to tell people how they can get eternal life. I love people and I want them to hear the good news. But when I learned that, hey, I'm going to also build up treasures in heaven from doing ministry work, that's, that's kind of icing on the cake. That, that's, uh, I'm excited about that too. And I'm, not, I'm not too, uh, you know, um, what's the word? I, I, I don't mind admitting it. No, it's it's about, not, you know it's, I'm glad you said that because it's like not only is it okay, but we're told to do that. Jesus himself tells us store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth does not come in and eat and thieves do not steal. He tells us to store treasures in heaven. So it can't be wrong to to uh to think about your treasures in heaven and what you're storing up there. Mm -hmm. Now, he um, concludes the point here saying memory is a basic element of personality. If we are truly ourselves in heaven, there must be continuity of memory from earth to heaven. We will not be different people, but the same people marvelously relocated and transformed. Heaven cleanses us, but does not revise or extinguish our origins or history. Undoubtedly, we will remember God's works of grace in our lives that comforted, assured, sustained, and empowered us to live for Him. That relates to the point you made, Mitch. That you know you don't want your you want to keep your identity. Yes, and I think I'm going to live in the in, in the poor section of heaven. The poor <laughs> section. <laughs> uh, I think. Uh, you're you're being very modest, Mitch. I think very highly of all the good works you do. You know, these lordship salvation teachers. You know, they want to uh, make the case that they're doing good works, and we have to do good works to get to heaven. And we know that's a that's a heresy. We don't go to heaven because of the good works that we do. We go to heaven because of the work Jesus did on our behalf. He paid for our sins. He gives us eternal life. Uh, we're only going there because of Jesus. But uh, they, they want to make it seem like we, you go to heaven because of the good things you do. And uh, so, uh, but Mitch, uh, you may not want to acknowledge the good things you do, but I know that there are some people who value them, and I'm sure that 
our great Savior God, Jesus Christ, does value what you're doing, Mitch. So be, well, absolutely. Be, I, I, uh, I, I believe, but the, the thing is, is that I don't do the things I do, I guess not for rewards. I just do them because God put it in me. I mean, he gave me the gospel. I, I can't shut up about it. I mean, that's that, that's basically why I do it. I can't, I you know, the good news just is in me, and I, it just has to come out. I have to tell people about it. I get upset when people try to try to live their lives in this lordship way and see people uh, bogged down by all of this this uh, oppression that they're, 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 that's not the light of Christ. And so, so any a reward that I get, you know, I I think the, the way I, I, it would hinder me to think about rewards in heaven. I know they're there, but the the thing is, is that the, the thing that I'm enjoying is just Christ and Christ alone. And and, and, and it is all, all the, the greater that, the, that God's going to lay up things for me in heaven. That, that's wonderful. But what's really wonderful to me is what Christ has done, that it's mm -hmm. bought, it's, it, heaven is bought and paid for. And when I know that, I can't help but, but proclaim his name and, and, and bring blessings to other people. And, and so it's sort of that's why I take my crown off and I hand it to him because he put it in me. And when he put it in me, it came out of me. And so I'm just I'm just grinning from ear to ear, thankful. Yeah, he's done. Yeah, I I was asked years ago by a street preacher why I was doing my street preaching. He said, "Are you are you doing this so that you can get rewards in heaven, or or or, or why?" And I said, "Well, my main reason is just because I love Jesus, and I I, I just love to talk about him." And my secondary reason is I love these people walking by who they may not have Jesus as their Savior. I want to tell them about this good news. And I care about them. And I said, but treasures and rewards and stuff, I'm ha I'll am i be happy to get them, but that's not my primary motivation. But on the other hand, if that was somebody's primary motivation, I can't criticize that either. Okay. I believe it's all about what's in the heart. I mean... Mm -hmm. You can have it as your primary motivation, but it it depends on where your heart is and how you do it and the motives behind doing it. But um, yeah, I, I'm with Brother Mitch completely because I've always been one to go by um, Matthew's 25, and you know I'm just one that wants to stand before the Lord and let Him tell me of all the good works that I've done and not yeah. me be prepared knowing what I've done, you know. Yeah. I went to a point in my walk where everything that I do is completely genuine with no yes. motivation behind it except yeah. for ser serving um, serving the Lord. Yes, yeah. uh, but, but, you know, well, and no. if you get that, if you get some icing on your cake, I think you'll be happy about it. <laughs> Okay, uh, now his next question is, do people in the intermediate heaven see what is happening on earth? So he says, if the martyrs in heaven know that God hasn't yet brought judgment on their persecutors, we covered this last time in Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11, he, made, he gave over 20, um, what would you call it, um, inferences that he took out of those verses. He, he inferred over 20 different conclusions from just those verses that was very interesting. We discussed that in the last uh, session. Uh, so he says, if the martyrs in heaven know that God hasn't yet brought judgment on their persecutors, it seems evident that the inhabitants of the intermediate heaven can see what's happening on earth, at least to some extent. When Babylon is brought down, an angel points to events happening on earth and says, quote, Rejoice over her, O heaven. Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets. God has judged her for the way she treated you, unquote. That's Revelation 18.20. That, that the angel specifically addresses people living in heaven indicates they're aware of what's happening on earth. Well, so uh, possibly, uh, maybe they're not aware of everything, as he said, but they certainly, there are scriptures that says they are aware of certain things. I just hope there isn't a camera on me. 
There is, Rich. All the time. Can, like, I don't know when it's going to be turned on. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I could be sitting there, and I don't know, you know, and all of a sudden the camera's on me. I have no I mean, idea. I, in, in fairness, you could make the statement that it's not a case so much that the people in heaven are watching the events happen so much as they are definitely made aware, whether it's by God or by angels. They're made aware of what's happening on Earth, so they do know what's happening. Whether they're watching it like a television, whether they're yeah. watching it or seeing it as events is 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 not really clear, but they're clearly aware of it, whether they're told or whether they're actually seeing it firsthand. Yeah, I just hope God gets my good side. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, they just just tune in on me when you know, like like let give me a little warning. You know, I get dressed and, and, and cleaned up a little. Which bit. one? Which one's your good side? <laughs> I, you know, I don't know that I have one. <laughs> Don't get on my back. <laughs> and, and, and I only say that because I feel the same way about myself. So that's like, <laughs> well, uh, that's a good distinction that you made, Eric, that uh, so far I don't think we can necessarily conclude that they're watching, but they certainly are informed. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if they are watching, though, uh, this is another example of Big Brother watching us, our lives, <laughs> except this is our brothers in heaven and our sisters in heaven. <laughs> Yeah, if they are watching, then hey guys, how you doing? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And Mitch, I think you should turn your face to the left. The right side is the better one. Uh, I that hurts my neck though. <laughs> okay. Okay. He says um, further there is quote the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting hallelujah and praising God for specific events of judgment that have just taken place on earth. That's Revelation 19 verses 1 through 5. Again, the saints in heaven are clearly observing what is happening. Let's read that verse here. Uh, Eric, look up Revelation 19 verses 1 through 5. And he's saying they're clearly observing what is happening on earth. So maybe he's nailing it down more specifically for us. Maybe they have YouTube up in heaven. And they're watching the show. I think God invented YouTube anyway. <laughs> okay, here you go. Uh, chapter 19, 1 through 5. Uh, and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteousness are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, I don't think uh, from that verse we can conclude they're observing. Uh, we do know that they are aware of it. So maybe they were informed or maybe they observed, and uh, maybe there's a giant screen that they're all watching. Like, like if you go to a, if you can't get to the live fight and you get to watch it on a satellite and you've got this big screen, what's that called? The, the satellite viewing of it? Oh, the, uh, um, uh. It's like the sign of a movie picture screen and people in the audience watching it. Maybe in heaven they got they got a, a screen and video watching it. What if they have popcorn up there? I hope so because, you know, popcorn, uh, I wouldn't want to have an attorney without popcorn. Yeah, I mean, I like popcorn. I hope they got popcorn. With lots okay. of butter and salt. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Tons of cholesterol because I know oh, I'll yeah. be healthy. You should have to worry about it. You have to worry about it. <laughs> Okay, he says, he says, because heaven's saints return with Christ to set up his millennial kingdom, uh, that's Revelation. Uh, Mitch, could you look up Revelation 19, verses 11 through 14? 19, 11 through 14. Yeah. It seems unthinkable to imagine they would have remained ignorant of the culmination of human history taking place on earth. The picture of saints in heaven blissfully unaware of what is transpiring, transpiring on earth seems insubstantial. After all, God and his angels uh, and the saints themselves are about to return for the ultimate battle in the history of the universe, after which Christ will be crowned king. Those on earth may be ignorant of heaven, but those in heaven are not ignorant of earth. Wow. 
it's a wonderful thing, and I, I think that the uh, idea of being ignorant, I think it we can clearly conclude that they're not ignorant, of, but they may not have complete knowledge of everything happening on Earth, but they're certainly uh, not ignorant of certain events, at least. R Mitch? Okay, hold on a second, because I had the Bible upside down, and I was, oh, I found 19, okay, 1911, okay. And I saw heaven opened up, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat upon it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. Do you want to go to 12? Yeah. And That's his cool. eyes are a flame of fire, and upon his head are many diadems. And he has the name written. He has a name written upon him, which no one knows except himself. Thirteen and fourteen also. And he is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Okay, so the point he's making about this is that here is the point in time where Jesus is about to come and make things right on earth. He's going to get rid of the evil, defeat the Antichrist, and then set up his, his kingdom. He's saying this is such a major, major event that uh, he, he thinks it unlikely that all of the saints in heaven would not be aware of what's what's about to happen and the, what's going on on earth. You think that's a, like a, a, a sensible conclusion? I think it might be like the news. You know how they send somebody on location? Yeah. You know, uh, here's a report from this certain spot. I mean, it, it actually makes sense because you can't, you don't want to be on somebody 20 Seven, but if an event happens and you want somebody to know about it, you can send them a clip, a video clip. If it's a family member, you know, somebody, you can have somebody, you know, I'll be the cameraman up in heaven. I'll bring it with me. You know, all of my relatives, you know, hey, I'll, I'll keep the pictures for you. Don't worry. When you get up here, you get a lot of laughs. Yeah. You know, and, and like, like in that way, you'd be able to keep track of events and see what's going on, and the news can get back and forth, you know, through the heavenly realms, you know. And the big events, of course, are going to be covered everywhere. Everybody's going to yeah. have it, just like everyone has television. I think, yeah. you know, I think the world does mirror somewhat what's going to be up in the heavens. I really do. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Uh, but with that, I have to go get some. I, I, my wife just brought me a wonderful sandwich. Okay. Heavenly, and I have to enjoy a little piece of heaven on earth. So I'm yes, right. okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, anybody want to comment on his uh, conclusion there uh, and Mitch's um, um, idea that uh, at least there's, they'll get reports and maybe like a reporter reporting to them? Yeah, I mean, it's when, when you look at everything when, on the level that we're going to be dealing with, all the saints, you know, the, the armies of heaven prepared as though we're, we're going with him to when he goes to wage war upon the earth and he goes to fix everything and make everything right, it seems senseless for us to have no clue as to why we're doing this or I mean it just doesn't it doesn't again it doesn't make any sense the case there's definitely more rationale to make the case that we would understand why we're coming back and the events that are going on and the things leading up to that and what our role is going to be when we go otherwise they're going to follow him get to a point where we get to earth and say okay what do I do now it's like, I mean it just it just doesn't seem uh, sensical it, it's it seems like you're leaving a lot of gaps by by insinuating that we wouldn't have any idea what's going on Okay, so so far we can see that clearly we're, we will have memories and we will we'll be aware of th certain things that are happening on earth. Uh, now, uh, whether we actually observe earth just by looking down and being able to see earth somehow, or if we're seeing it like on a screen or if someone's giving us a report, what's another a na name for a, a messenger, a reporter? For messenger, angel. Yeah, aren't they? Aren't they messengers or like our news reporter? They're in a way. Absolutely. Well, they were always the deliverers of the news. They delivered uh, the news to Mary, the news to the shepherds, the news to. Yeah. The... So I can see how the, these angels could be giving a report to people, to all of us in heaven, 
uh, as a reporter would say, these are the events that are happening right now so that we're all aware of it. If, if we're not observing it, at least we'll get, be getting the reports from these messengers known as angels. Okay, uh, in the Old Testament account of King Saul wrongly appealing to witch of Endor to call upon Samuel to come back from the afterlife, the medium was terrified when God actually sent Samuel. Interestingly, Samuel remembered what Saul had done before Samuel died. Uh, and he was aware of what had happened since he died. Um, Tiffany, can you look up 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 16 through 19? It's, and he says, though God could, could have briefed Samuel on all this, it seems likely the prophet knew simply because those in heaven are aware of what happens on earth. He certainly gives us a lot of examples to consider his, his uh, points. And the thing I like that Randy does while, while Tiffany's looking that up, the thing I, the thing I like what he does is he does offer the other aspect of it. He does he's, – he's not being dogmatic about one – you know, this is the only way. He always goes back and all through the book, and he always says, "Now I could be wrong. You may not agree with me. This could be off basis, but from my understanding, it makes common sense to come to such and such conclusion." And he does do that. He doesn't. He doesn't insinuate that this is the only way, and there's no other way around it. He, but he does show a strong case, like you said, through, through scripture, um, that apparently, in some way, we we are able to at least see. Some events, and, and maybe this is kind of like along what Mitch was saying. Maybe, and what you were saying about the angels. Maybe this has got a little bit of something to do, as far as who we are individually in heaven, as far as what kind of information we're privy to. Maybe, maybe us in groups in heaven are going to be privy to certain information because of things we're going to do when we come down to earth. Ooh, so that's kind of wow. I, that's a really interesting uh, proposition there. That. Uh, uh, I think as we go through this book, we're going to find also that uh, um, people do not have equal status in heaven. Uh, and we have different roles and responsibilities, positions in our jobs throughout eternity. And uh, as the scriptures say, that some people will govern over ten cities and some over one city and so on. So maybe certain uh, people will be privy to more information than others. I don't know. Tiffany, do you have those verses? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and then Samuel, then said Samuel, Wherefore then doest thou act of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and is become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake of, by me. For the Lord hath rent the, rent the kingdom out of thy hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek, therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. And the Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Mm -hmm. hmm. So it seems here that Samuel, uh, he not only has knowledge of what happened before he died on, while he was on earth, but he has knowledge of events that happened while he was in heaven since he died. And then he also has future prophetic knowledge of things that were going to happen. So he seemed to have knowledge of past, present, and future in this case. Now, is Samuel just a special person? Uh, maybe, as uh, Eric, you said, that maybe we'll not all have as much knowledge, uh, or, or maybe everybody will be aware of these things. I don't know. Well, you know, it's interesting. There was a, Based on what we were talking about earlier, and there's another verse in Scripture in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 29. Jesus says to Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You know, it's possible that you know, the people who grow up, who are born in the millennium, who go into the millennial kingdom, they're never going to know a world without the Lord. They're, they're not going to understand. All they'll know 
about that would be based on those who lived a life in a world where we didn't see Christ firsthand. He wasn't there with us. He didn't he didn't rule over the earth. We we had sin that dwelled on the earth and corrupted the earth as it was. We we had, you know, they'll never know life like that. You know, it's possible that uh, for Samuel and the things that um, that were done in his life, or others uh, that we, we maybe will be revered because we were some of the of those who lived in a world that was like that, and, and others who go into the future will never won't really know that except those who actually experienced it. It's something. It's an experience that they won't have gone through. Even angels haven't lived lives like we have, um, exposed to sin and have to deal with the things that we wrestle with on a regular basis. They they've, they've never had to do that. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah, they are really a unique population of people in that millennium. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, we should we should really divert and uh, go off into that for for another hour if, if I allowed it. But and I'm, I'm tempted because I, I find it really interesting. But I think you you made a good point there. Then he says, uh, when called from heaven to the transfiguration on earth, Moses and Elijah quote appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem, unquote. That's Luke 9.31. They seemed fully aware of the drama they'd stepped into, of what was currently transpiring on earth, and of God's redemptive plan about to be accomplished. And surely they returned to heaven remembering what they'd discussed with Jesus. Now, I, I think that's a logical conclusion. The, the only thing that I think that is uh, maybe an um, argument against his conclusion is that uh, he's citing some very exceptional people. And maybe Moses, Elijah, and Samuel, and so on. Uh, in these cases, maybe uh, it's because of who they are that they are uh, and angels. You know, they're, they're aware of much more than your typical person in heaven right now. But I don't know. I'm, I'm just saying that's, that's a possibility. I don't have any scripture saying that they're, everybody's not aware of these things. I don't know. Okay. Um, Hebrews 12.1 uh, tells us to, quote, run with perseverance the race marked out for us, unquote, creating the mental picture of the Greek competitions which were watched in watched intently by throngs of engrossed fans sitting high up in the ancient stadiums. The, quote, great cloud of witnesses, unquote, refers to the saints who've gone before us, who accompl whose accomplishments on the playing field of life are now part of our rich history. The imagery seems to suggest that those saints, the spiritual, quote, athletes, unquote, of old, are now watching us, and cheering us from the great stadium of heaven that looks down on the field of earth, the witnesses are said to surround us, not merely to have preceded us. Even if, as some argue, the word witnesses may refer to their faithful service for God more than to the idea of their watching us, other passages clearly demonstrate heaven's awareness of earth. Now, see how he presents it there. This is something we were discussing earlier about how do they have this knowledge? Is it from observing? Is it from reports? And does everybody have the knowledge or select people? Tiffany? Yeah. You think you think it could be, uh, as he's described it there, as like a great stadium of witnesses who are watching the events? Yeah, I, I believe that there are, are the assigned assignments maybe there are a host of a host who is set aside to watch and report mm -hmm. hmm. uh, well one thing that I hope everybody who's watching this uh, uh, can finally it comes to understand is that uh, uh, we're going to have memories in heaven Otherwise, we would no longer be ourselves. We would totally lose our identity if we didn't have memories of our lives and who we are. Uh, and and uh, we're not going to be ignorant in heaven. We're going to know a lot of facts about what's going on earth, whether we're observing them or we get reports, uh, whether we know everything that's going on earth or certain events. Uh, we're, we're going to be informed to a certain extent at least. 
the unfolding drama of redemption awaiting Christ's return is currently happening on Earth. Earth is center court, center stage, awaiting the consummation of Christ's return and the establishment of his kingdom. This seems a compelling reason to believe that the current inhabitants of heaven would be able to observe what's happening on Earth. He keeps on making the point of observing, and uh, you know he cited some verses like the witnesses and and the uh, what was the other one? Their witnesses and their uh, great cloud of witnesses, uh, and like watching an athletic event, you know that kind of a thing. So uh, you know he's kind of p pasting it together to support this idea of actually observing. But I don't know if, if he's nailing it down so that uh, I can agree 100% yet. Somebody breaking something? <laughs> Broken glasses. Um, in heaven, Christ watches closely what transpires on earth, especially in the lives of God's people. Uh, Eric, could you look up Revelation? Oh, I think that's chapters 2 through 3. No, we won't need to go into that. That would okay. be two, two full chapters. Okay. Uh, but if you read Revelations chapter 2 and 3, uh, it, it, sh it it seems to say that Christ is watching closely what's transpiring on earth. Uh, if the sovereign God's attention is on earth, why wouldn't the attention of his heavenly subjects be focused here as well? When a great war is transpiring, are those in the home country uninformed and unaware of it? When a great drama is taking place, do those who know the writer, producer, and cast and have great interest in the outcome refrain from watching? Pretty convincing our arguments. Uh, I mean, it's just uh, some of it is is it clearly supported and stated by scripture. Some of it is alluded to in scripture, and some of it is just logical conclusions that we think. Well, why wouldn't it be that way? It seems logical that it would. Oh boy, I'm glad Mitch wasn't here for that part on 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 Samuel. Man, my okay. ears are ringing. What happened? Oh man, we we were while we were gone, we were talking about Samuel and the Witch of Endor again. I, I didn't want to open up that can of worms again. <laughs> <laughs> Your timing was perfect. You you joined the show at a perfect time. You stepped away for the perfect time. Yes. But Mitch, we didn't mention your name. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Randy keeps on giving us examples to, to support the idea that he thinks that uh, people are actually going to be observing on earth, not just getting reports. <clears throat> then he says, angels saw Christ on earth. Uh, Mitch, well, you've got your sandwich there. Are you still eating, Mitch? you got your Bible. Oh, I ate my Bible. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I know that somebody ate a book in the, in the, in the Revelation, ate a little book, and it gave Tasted him like honey. It had a bitter taste or something? No, it tasted like honey. It just made my stomach bitter. made your stomach bitter. Oh, right? oh that's right. Okay. Uh, but if you have the scriptures there, Mitch, look up 1 Timothy. Oh, never mind. No, 1 Timothy 3.16, not 2 Timothy 3.16. Mitch made a video on 2 Timothy 3.16. Yeah. I didn't want to go there. Oh, um, yeah, that's my favorite verse in the yeah, whole Bible. 1 Timothy 3.16. 1 first Timothy 3.16. First. And by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who has revealed has revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, beheld by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up into glory. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this is a verse. This is one of the verses that I feel that KJV is very important because it, it says in KJV, God was manifest in the flesh. In all other translations it says Jesus was manifest in the flesh or he was manifest in the flesh, but in KJV specifically it says God was manifest in the flesh mm -hmm. in 1 Timothy 3.16. Mm -hmm. But the point it's making here is to support the idea that angels saw Christ on earth. So angels from heaven observed Christ on earth in his earthly ministry. So if angels were observing, again, uh, obviously uh, at least some people have been observing everything on earth. There are clear indications that the angels know what is happening on earth. Um, Eric, could you look up 1 Corinthians 
4, verse 9. Tiffany, you look up 1 Timothy 5, verse 21. If angels are observing, why not saints? It seems that the people of God in, he uh, in heaven would have as much of a vested interest in the spiritual events happening on earth as angels do. Wouldn't we expect that the body of and bride of Christ in heaven would be intensely interested in the rest of the body and bride of Christ still living on earth? Okay, you got those verses? Yeah, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death. For we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. Okay. A spectacle unto angels. So that he's concluding that angels are observing the spectacle of the, what's going on with the early church. Mm -hmm. uh, the next verse is what? 1 Timothy? 1 Timothy 5 and 21. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the, select, the elect angels that thou observe these things without re preferring them one before another, doing nothing by partiality. Okay, it's saying that they're uh, observing again. And Mitch, what's First Timothy three? Oh, you read Mitch First Timothy three sixteen, all right? Yes, I did. Okay. You want me to read Second Timothy three sixteen? No, please, not, please not right now. Okay. <laughs> Even though I really like your video, but some people, some people are going to burn you at the stake. <laughs> I like steak. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we got the hot sauce. <laughs> it is, he says Abraham and Lazarus saw the rich man in hell, uh, Luke 16, uh, verse 23 through 26. If it is possible, at least in some cases, to see hell from heaven. Why would people be unable to see Earth from heaven? Now, right? here, well, here real quick, here real quick, uh, he makes a mistake again because, and this is kind of what we alluded to before. And it's not to knock him or criticize him, and it doesn't take away what we're saying. But they didn't see hell from heaven. They saw hell. They saw torments from the Abraham's bosom, which technically is the same place. It's just there's a, a gulf that separates them in Hades. So they did not see hell from heaven. And that's just a clarification that needs to be made. I really, it's one of the points I disagree with him here. It needs to be made correct. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. but, but the rationale to say, you know, but you could just as well say if people could see from Abraham's bosom into torments and vice versa, then why could people not see from earth to heaven? You could make the same case, absolutely. I, I think there's no reason why you can't make that case. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, because uh, paradise, in, in Hades you had paradise and torments, right. and if the people in paradise are taken up, and paradise is taken up into uh, the intermediate heaven now, it's just right. relocated. So, right. uh uh, it seems like uh, maybe it does make sense that uh, if they could observe torments, then then why can't uh, the people in heaven be observing Earth? These are just more things that you know he's just building his case, mm -hmm. and I don't think there's one one point he makes that makes the case. But but by piling on uh, one thing after another, it certainly gives me more support sure. for this idea. Uh, Christ said, quote, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Luke 15, 7. Wow. Before I go on, that's, uh, that's a that's, that's pretty uh, strong case for um, rejoicing in heaven right now. I mean, come on. Mm -hmm. uh, I've often said this uh, to people who... You know, put your faith in Jesus, make a comment, tell us you, you trusted Jesus and you're saved now and we'll, we want to celebrate. And the angels in heaven will be celebrating and rejoicing every time you, someone does get saved. So we, we're very much aware that this is going on. So uh, the angels in heaven now and the saints who are in this intermediate heaven right now, uh, if they're rejoicing every time someone gets saved, Boy, there must be a lot of celebrating because if you look at the whole world, like probably every second someone else, someone new person is getting saved. It's like a constant. It must be a television show. <laughs> right. You know, it's like tune in. Oh, this guy's just about to get saved. Oh, wait. Get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was He's reading it. 
He's reading it. He's contemplating it. There goes the prayer. <laughs> Whoa! Yes! Yes! Hallelujah! Yes. Hallelujah! <laughs> oh, man. That would be a lot of fun. You know we're laughing, but you know what? <laughs> Maybe there is something like that going on. I mean, it's like you never know. I mean, it's I, 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 to me, based on what we've read here. I mean, to me, there's no question that the people in heaven are aware of events that are happening, whether they're gotta, being told or whether they see them. The question is, how much do they see? That's, I think, the real question. If people were going to ask that question and put the caveat in there and say, well, we see a lot, but we can't see everything, I'd say, yeah, I agree with that. But there'd be, there's no reason for us to see everything. God can see everything, and he's able to see everything. We don't need to see everything. So, But we are definitely aware of what's going on. With those earphones, I would make you the commentator. <laughs> Oh, man. You're not so, you know what? Do, no, don't even get me started on the commentators, man. Because you don't want to go there. I'm not, I don't oh, want no, that job. Would you do a would you do a whole YouTube channel on people being saved? Oh, I'll give. I'll do. The whole, I'll, we can do the blow by blow. I'll do it. Well, you did a great job. I think we could do it with the two. We'll put me and you up there. We'll both do that. We'll have a booth. We'll have a broadcast booth in heaven, and we'll broadcast it out there. Yeah. Big audience, you know. Oh, he came to... close. He came so close, folks, but he missed it. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> Look how much fun we're having even thinking about that. Really? See, that's, that's why I think people are missing out when they don't have studies about things like this. They don't have to contemplate these things. It's fun. It's fun. It really is. Yeah. And he, he says, um, uh, there is rejoicing in the, present, in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. He says, notice it does not speak of rejoicing by the angels, but in the presence of angels. Who is doing this rejoicing in heaven? I believe Saved by 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 John three sixteen. Hallelujah. Sorry. <laughs> he says, I believe it logically includes not only God, but also the saints in heaven who would so deeply appreciate the wonder of human conversion, especially the conversion of those who knew and loved who they knew and loved on earth. If they rejoice over conversions happening on earth, then obviously they must be aware of what is happening on earth, and not just generally, but specifically, down to the details of individuals coming to faith in Christ. You wonder if it's going to be like, they're going to be like bar mitzvah parties kind of thing, or like a wedding party, or a feast up in heaven, like, like oh, this was, this, was your, this was your salvation party that we threw. You know, wow. I mean, you know, with cakes. <laughs> Yeah, it's probably well. I mean, when, consider how many people get saved on a regular basis. It's probably just an ongoing party. It's a party that never stops. They just keep well, that's, enjoying. Seeing. That's like the Jews, though. There's right. a bar mitzvah right. every day. There's right, a it just every other keeps week. going. Right, it's just always partying. Have a tequila. Have no, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> la, 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 la. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the chair and everything. That is so, that problem there. Well, Mitch, you, you certainly are painting a very graphic, wonderful picture for us. Okay. Now, one of the things I really like about his, his book, Heaven by Randy Alcorn, is that uh, he continues asking questions. And these are all the questions. By the way, the, the title of this study, this series of um, uh, Bible talk shows is heaven all your questions answered and that's what Randy Alcorn does in this book he just has a list of like a 500 questions and he, these are questions that some of us have probably thought about and not some of us maybe we didn't put a lot of study in and trying to find an answer and some of the questions are things I never even dreamed of asking myself and yet it's an interesting question so his book is one question after another, and then his attempt to answer the question. His next question is, do people in heaven pray for those on earth? He says, based on the scriptural evidence, I believe that departed saints currently in the intermediate heaven do intercede in prayer, at least sometimes, for those of, of us still on earth. Christ, the God-man, is in heaven, at the right hand of God interceding for people on earth. That's Romans 8.34, which tells us there is at least one person who has died and gone to heaven and is now praying for those on earth. The martyrs in heaven also pray to God. That's in Revelation 6.10. 
asking him to take specific action on earth. They are praying for God's justice on the earth, which has uh, intercessory implications for Christians now suffering here. The sense of connection and loyalty to the body of Christ and concern for the saints on earth would likely be enhanced, not diminished, by being in heaven. Ephesians 3.15 in case, in any case, Revelation 6 makes it clear that some who have died are still in uh, and are now in heaven are praying concerning what's happening on earth. Uh, now, this is something that we have to make sure you parse it out well because if people could come to some uh, uh, serious er erroneous conclusions here, because a lot of people, particularly in Roman Catholicism, we discussed this before, think that. We right now can pray, pray uh, and talk to uh, uh, the our lost love. I mean, our loved ones who are in heaven now, or particularly uh, what the Roman Catholic Church refers to as saints. Now we know that the Bible uh, use of the word saint does not mean a, a very rare breed of Christian that is super super good. Uh, no, the Bible says that a saint is interchangeable for word Christian or believer. Everyone who believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior for eternal life, we're all is Bible considers us all saints. Yes. So, uh, but the Roman Catholic Church thinks that these a saint is a super, super, uh, like a Superman saint, a Christian. Uh, so they think that they can actually pray to these saints. And we know that, no, we don't pray to saints. We pray to God uh, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. And uh, uh, now, so how does that, how do we make sure that we're not confusing this issue with this idea that the saints in heaven could be praying for us right now, but we do not pray to them? Well, send me $39.95. <laughs> I don't make sure. Uh, wait a second. How many box tops is that? Have you collected it? Have, have, have you got it? <laughs> and some bottle oh. caps. I need <laughs> And I will send you your official sainthood. <laughs> or I'll give you my picture, Saint Mitch. Yeah. No, no uh, you're right. Separated. Saint means separated for God. Anybody who know, who believes in Christ. Yeah. Saint, and this whole idea of super saints and and praying to saints uh, really does muddle the idea that, that that really our power is in Christ. And people might think, well, dude, Jesus doesn't have all this time for me. I've got to pray to Michael. Well, how many people are praying to Michael? How many people are praying to Joseph? I I, I pray to my cousin Louis, but you know, it, it's it's not about it. it, it it really is a, a, a huge uh, misconception and something that uh, that that we really just need to focus on Christ and that's it. That's what's important. I, I think I think you have to back up here and and make it and simplify the issue. You know what is prayer? Okay, let's back up and say what is prayer. Prayer is us communing with God. That's what prayer is. That's it. We talk to God in our prayers. We have a conversation with God. We bring our issues to him. We ask for forgiveness for things we've done to him. We, we, we keep a fellowship with him. The, the saints in heaven, they don't have to pray in the same way we do to God. They're having direct conversations with God. Their prayers are actually direct conversation with him right there. So it's a better form of prayer that we have. We, we, we pray from afar. We, we communicate with God from afar, and Jesus is our... You know our link with God. He allows that communication. You know he 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 uh, uh, he provides that link. You know the Holy Spirit with us to to commune with God to the fullest we possibly can as Christians. Now the the Christians, those who are dead and who are in heaven, their their prayers are simple conversations with God. There's, these are simply things they place before God. He's right there before them. He's right there in front of them. There's no com It's it's never a communication process between us and them. And maybe this kind of I don't know. Maybe I'm. I don't want to go too far with it, but maybe this kind of does kind of speak to the idea that things are conveyed to the saints in heaven. Otherwise, if if we could talk to – you know what I mean? Otherwise, maybe there could be direct communication or the idea behind direct communication. Well, maybe it's more that these things are conveyed rather than they're seeing and – you know what I mean? Maybe not. I'm just saying. Well, you know, in, in my opinion, I, I really kind of think that God hears us, 
But when we're up in heaven, we hear him. <laughs> you know, I mean, because he's there talking to us. We're with him. We've gone through this life. We're living in a world where we're living by faith. We're not supposed to see right now. It's a veiled world until we get to heaven. Otherwise, then the mystery, would, there wouldn't be no mystery. But up there, the mystery is, 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 there is no mystery up there. So these saints, they probably have just, the, God hears us probably just as well as, as the saints are talking to him. He's just not talking back to us. Or if he does, you know, I'll be kind of afraid if he does. But many people are like, well, God told me this today. Mitch, I saw you down there. Or, you know, I don't want to know, you know. But, but, you know, he could talk to me. But I think up there it's going to, there, it, there's going to be no mystery. It'll be wide open. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. And let me make this, this is a little different subject, but I think this is an interesting point to make. My wife is always teasing me because I tend to talk a lot with my hands. And I want her to come and watch Mitch, and then she then she won't say anything to me anymore because Mitch talks with his hands more than anybody I know. And you see, I, 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 I do like Italian. You see, in an Italian, there's a certain way to say something, like this. Fettuccini. That's right. If you don't say it like this, you can't say it. Fettuccini. Fettuccini al fredo. You yeah, as, say as, it like this. Yeah, as, as an Italian, you know what I'm saying. As an Italian, I can tell you I am just as bad as Mitch. <laughs> yeah. I absolutely talk with my hands all the time. Yeah, I don't say it's bad by any means. I think it's, it adds to your communicating skill. But uh, one thing is uh, Mitch talking with his hands, it stands out like a sore thumb. I mean, your sore little finger. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, so I think that we're we're saying no, no. If you think that you can pray to saints in heaven, you're wrong. You know, there's no way that we can communicate directly with saints. However, conversely, it seems that the the saints in heaven could be up there praying for us. We know that they're uh, aware when we get saved and they're celebrating. So uh, as uh, as expounding on what Mitch said, they're they're following like watching Lun and rooting for us. Oh, he's yeah, he got saved, yay! And they're out all the while they might be praying at the same time. Oh, God, oh, God, give him some faith, help him, Lord. <laughs> okay. Uh, so now it says, uh, uh, if prayer is simply talking to God. Presumably, we will pray more in heaven than we do now, not less. And given our righteous state in heaven, our prayers will be more effective than ever. Uh, Revelation 5.8 speaks of, quote, the prayers of the saints in a context that may include saints in heaven, not uh, just on earth. We are never told to pray to the saints, but only to God. But the, the saints may well be praying for us. Wow, we just uh, we're we're maybe this proves we're smarter than Randy because we covered it we covered it without knowing he was going to say that. Uh, I've actually read ahead, but uh, okay. If people in heaven are allowed to see at least some of what transpires on earth, and clearly they are, as we've seen, then it would seem strange for them not to intercede in prayer. If we believe that heaven is a place of ignorance or disinterest about earth, we will, <laughs> I would say conversely that's true, uh, earth is a place of in disinterest about heaven, it seems, from a lot of people we know. Um, uh, it says, we will naturally assume that people in heaven don't pray for people on earth. If you think, well, let me start that from over. It says, if we believe that heaven is a place of ignorance or disinterest about earth, then we will naturally assume that people in heaven don't pray for people on earth. However, if we believe that people in heaven are aware of events on earth and that they talk to God about his plan, his purpose, and his people, we will naturally assume they do pray for the people on earth. In my opinion, scriptures argue for the second assumption, not the first. I believe the burden of proof falls on those who would argue that people in heaven don't pray for those on the earth. Okay. So I think, it, to me, it's pretty safe to conclude that, uh, yeah, that I, I believe they are praying for us on earth. So, I mean, now we, we've, we've learned already that, yes, um, the saints in heaven now have memories. 
uh, and they also have uh, awareness of things that are happening on Earth, and we <clears throat> think it's safe to say that they're praying for us, and they're also celebrating every time we get saved. Now, the next question Randy asks is, can it be heaven if people are aware of anything bad on Earth? Wow. Tiffany? Say that again. I am I I called your name because this pertains to something you said earlier. Um, okay, the, the question Randy Alcorn asks is, can it be heaven, or let me rephrase it, can it really be heaven if people are aware of anything bad on Earth? Yeah. Remember, we started off talking about this idea that, uh, you know, we, we hate to know, remember sad things on earth and know about sad things on earth. It might take away our joy in heaven. So he's addressing that question now. So he says, many books on heaven maintain that those in heaven cannot be aware of people and events on earth because they would be made unhappy by all the suffering and evil. Thus, heaven would not truly be heaven. Hmm. We talked about it a little bit earlier, but now we're going to look at his arguments uh, against that. Uh, he says, I believe this argument is invalid. After all, God knows exactly what's happening on earth, yet it doesn't diminish heaven for him. I think, I think uh, Tanya made that point uh, last in the last session. We, we, we were discussing this briefly, and she, uh, she said that same thing. So uh, that's a very good um, way to... <clears throat> understand this. Uh, I mean, uh, God knows all the bad things are going to happen. It seemed like God would always be depressed, <laughs> you know, but he's not. Um, likewise, it's heaven It's heaven for the angels, even though they also know what's happening on earth. In fact, angels in heaven see the, see the torment of hell, but it doesn't negate their joy in God's presence. Uh, see Revelation 14.10. Abraham and Lazarus saw the rich man's agonies in hell, but it didn't cause paradise to cease to be paradise. Surely then, nothing they could see on earth could ruin heaven for them. Again, the parable does not suggest that people in heaven normally gaze into hell. Uh, again, uh, we could cite that he's talking about Hades and the, the place of, of paradise and the, the gulf between paradise and torments. It's not really the heaven we're referring to now. Um, okay, so before we get to Randy's points where he's going to uh, make the case that, yeah, it would still be heaven even if we're aware of all the misery, even if we remembered our suffering, if we, even if we're aware of suffering of our friends and family, uh, it would still be heaven. I mean, what's your, what's your first inclination on that? I'd like to have a selective memory. <laughs> you know, like you're showing me pictures, and okay, well, I'll keep that one. Uh, you know what I mean? And uh, I'll throw and this one away. And, well, know. brother, and I, have, natural, I think that's a natural response that, that, that Mitch, it's a natural response people tend to have. They tend to feel that way. But I think they miss the point that when we go to be in heaven and become the people we're truly meant to be, we will for the first time ever know and understand fully God's perfect justice. And when we do, these things we will be able to deal with and see. It, 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 we, we can't deal with it on the level that we're in now because we're not perfected. We're not who we're really supposed to be. But when we are, we will understand these things and we'll be able to take these things and understand them fully. Mm -hmm. I, I believe so, but I also believe that, you know what, we don't dwell on, on, on these things. We're not, not going to be lost in heaven and so many other things. My mind is not going to be there. Yeah, sure, I'll probably have memories of all of this stuff. Selective memory to a certain degree, yes. Why? Because there's certain things that, that I want to think about, and there's certain things that I don't want to think about. And, and because God has put me through a whole life, I'm glad I don't have a, a what do you call, a, a, a photo, photographic memory or autographic memory where I remember everything at the same time, which I don't think that's exactly how it works. But I just kind of like the idea of just going with the flow mm -hmm. and... You know, being lost in his in his grace and his goodness, and lost in in the city up there, and, and where I'm going to be, or what I'm going to be doing up there, and sure, having some note of it, yes, but it being prevalent and thrown in my like my sins, they're forgotten pretty much. I mean, they're only there maybe as a, a as a remnant of of some sort 
to, to remind me where I came from. But mainly I don't dwell in the past. I'm looking forward to where I'm going to and, and, and where I am, especially when I'm, when I'm in the kingdom. So, mm -hmm. so I really think that, yeah, sure, we may, we may have a memory of that, but there'll be so much other things to concentrate on that I don't think that it will be that big of a deal. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you said that you wanted to have a selective memory, um, and my, my wife says that I have a selective memory. <laughs> uh, but I tell her, no, I have a, I have a phonographic memory. <laughs> oh, look who's joined us. It's Austin Bell. Hey. Hey, Austin. How's Austin. everybody doing? We're fantastic, man. We're talking about heaven. Of course we're doing great. Great, great. Good, good. Yeah. So I'm glad you could uh, could make it for at least a uh, part of this. Um, yeah, we've already learned an awful lot in the study today. We've been talking about how uh, we're going to have memories. When we go to heaven, we don't lose our memory. And we're also going to be uh, informed. We're, we're not going to be ignorant in heaven. We're going to be informed and uh, knowledgeable about things that are going on in earth. Whether we're going to be observing them, like watching a big screen TV or somehow looking down at earth, or if, or if we're just going to receive reports like an angel messenger giving us reports of events going on on earth. Uh, but we know we're going to also always be celebrating every time someone gets saved. Uh, everybody in heaven is going to be celebrating. So it will be like a constant celebration. So that's kind of what we've been discussing for the, the last hour and 20 minutes. Awesome. Real fast, just clarify: we're getting reports during the tribulation period. No, right, even right now, um, uh, the, the people, the saints in heaven, right now. Now we know oh, God knows what's right. going on. God knows what's going on. Angels also are aware of things that are going on uh, on Earth right now, and the saints who are in heaven right now uh, are being informed. Uh, and are aware of events. They don't, they're not omniscient. They don't know every single thing that's going on in, on Earth, but, but at least certain, at least select events, they're informed. And uh, we're discussing that maybe they're informed through this me uh, messengers, which are sometimes called angels. Okay? Okay, understood. Thank you. All right. So um, now we ask this question is, okay, uh, if we are aware of the bad bad things that are going on on earth, is that somehow going to take away our joy in heaven? Will we get depressed? And that's what we're asking asking that question now. Uh, so uh, let me get your reaction to that, Brother Austin. Uh, if you are in heaven right now, or the people who who are in heaven right now, if they have knowledge of bad things that are happening on earth, is that going to take away their joy? No. I'd say that because. Christ is our joy, and wherever He is, we'll be also. And knowing that, you know, we're already there. I mean, I understand that there'll be tears at the judgment at the judgment seat of Christ before, like rewards and things that they could have done that they missed out on. But I think overall, for the an atmosphere, I don't I don't see it being at an oppressive state. I see it always being a continual happy, celebrative, uh, almost like a partying state. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's go on. I think I left off. Uh, if I'm missing something, Eric, you tell me. I'm going to that middle paragraph. It says it's also possible. Mm -hmm. Yep. That e even though joy would predominate in the intermediate heaven, there could be periodic sadness because there's still so much evil and pain on earth. Christ grieved for people when he lived on earth. Um, Matthew 23 verse 37 through 39, and John 11, 33 through 36. Does he no longer grieve just because he's in heaven? Or does he still hurt for his people when they suffer? Uh, Acts 9, verses 4 and 5 gives a clear answer. Jesus said, quote, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? When Saul asked who he was, he replied, I am Jesus whom ye are, you are persecuting. Doesn't Christ's identification with those being persecuted on earth suggest he's currently hurting for his people, even as he's in heaven? 
tell you the truth, Bar Luke, I uh, want to take back my answer. Yes, to that. I, I read an article earlier in the week I totally forgot about. Uh, yes, I want to take back my answer. Yes, there can be those moments of uh, sadness. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, agree, I agree with Austin. It's it's we we see and this this again we can't to ask the per, to ask somebody these questions about now you can't really answer these questions because you're not going to be the same person in heaven. You're 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 going to be different in heaven. How you see things, the understanding you will have at that point. Um, like like Austin said was he came he came on perfect timing. He came on what he said was Christ is our joy, and that's. I think that's a key element there is, you know, the, the Christ being there with us will overwhelm us with such joy where there's periodic moments where we may hear about suffering or know about suffering. Like, for instance, he asked the question, I believe during the tribulation that we're – in ways we're going to be aware of what's going on because we're going to be – like we read about, we're going to be prepared um, – to, to, to come back with Christ, to rule and reign with him. We're going to be on white horses. We're going to come back with him. So clearly we'll know why. We'll know what's about to happen, which is Armageddon, which is happening at that moment. So um, so we'll, we'll know these things. But it's on earth we tend to have sorrow in, in despair, if that makes sense to you guys. It, we tend to do it in a way where we, we can't see the light in the darkness sometimes because we're so overwhelmed by it. The things like that. It won't be that way in heaven. Though we'll feel compassion for those suffering, and Christ feels compassion. It's not. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a sadness in despair. It's 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 a sadness of the moment and and of an instance. That, but we know ultimately God's. Um, you know. God's glory will be will be fulfilled. His. It, w this is all for a purpose, and will be will be built up in that. Mm -hmm. I mean. Yeah. I think that's a good distinction, talking about the point of despair. Uh, Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? And, of course, he's not there, so he's talking about the church, the believers. Why are you persecuting the believers, those who believe in me? And uh, so he's, he, but he's not in a state of despair over it, and that, that would be a, a, uh, that would be a totally different uh, conclusion. Yeah, but he is not... Uh, he's obviously disturbed by it and not happy with it, but he's still God. He's still obviously, um, and if he's uh, uh, if he's able to deal with it, obviously we can't do everything he he does. But I think that in, in heaven we we may be aware of these things and we may be sad over them, but it's not going to overwhelm us with grief and despair that way it would. Like right now, if, some, if something really horrible happened in, in in my life, you know, I had a big loss. I mean, I might go into a great deep depression and despair, but I don't think it's that kind of a reaction, as, as Eric said. That's a good, good differentiation. I think it might be like a movie. A movie? You know, sort of like a Peter Jackson film, or you know, or, or you know how how there's there's ups and downs and and highs and lows, and 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 we're all watching it like a soap opera or whatever it is, and God is just. We're watching what God is unfolding right before our eyes, and the surprises that we didn't know about, uh, the joys, the tears. I think that that might all be there, but from the perspective of knowing that they're in Christ. Mm -hmm. But you know, Rachel was weeping for her children, right? I mean, that that was something that was happening. You know, Jesus cried over Lazarus. You know, so so there. You know, Jesus wept, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so so is it emotional? Yes. But I think that the thing is, is that as it unfolds, like we see the glory of it all, and when we see how spectacular it all is, it we, it won't be a thumbs down movie. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be a thumbs up movie. Mm -hmm. I think so. I'm wait. You know, I'm I can give you some critical reviews, but you know, I'm, I'm pretty <laughs> sure it, 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 it'll be pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually actually that's a great analogy. I really like Mitch's analogy. I, I think I, I think he's dead on. I think he's spot on with that. I think it is going to be something in the moment where you know that part of feeling compassion to the point where we have tears, whether they're of tears don't come for one reason. There are tears of joy. There are tears of you know would would we not have tears of joy in heaven? I don't think so. I think we'd have tears of joy. Um, I, I, we go back to what we were all talking about. You have those moments where we express. Um, emotion, which is our humanity, it's who we are, and God has emotions. He expresses emotions. Um, the Bible tells us He has emotions. He's a jealous God. He's uh, so. 
you know, this is part of what makes us humanity. It's, it's who we are as a people. So to feel those things but not be overwhelmed by them, maybe that's the best description I could give. To yeah. feel them but not be overwhelmed by them. Yeah. I still can't get over the idea that maybe Howard Cosell will be in heaven commentating, you know. <laughs> this is Howard Cosell speaking for salvation. Here we are in Akron, Ohio, where this man is reading his scriptures. Uh-oh, it slipped out of his hand and fell on his foot. It opened up the page. What's this? John 3.16. Here it comes, John 3.16. For God so loved the world, saved! <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, it's good. Very good. Uh, but uh, let me say that... Um, before I forget, you know, I don't have that perfect memory because I'm not in heaven yet, but uh, <laughs> uh, a couple of people referred to uh, uh, tears, no tears. Uh, well, there, there is a verse that says that there'll be no more uh, death or sorrow or crying or pain or tears, and but that that is referring to the eternal heaven. And we're, right now we're talking about the, the intermediate heaven. In the eternal heaven, of course, all that stuff is done away with. There's no reason to be sad. There's nothing that there can't put me. Obviously, why would you ever have to cry if there's no more death or sorrow or or pain or anything like that? You, you know, you, you can always be happy. You won't have to have to cry anymore. Um, all That's right. A good so point. It says, if Jesus, who is in heaven, feels sorrow for his followers, might not others in heaven grieve as well? It's one thing to no longer cry because there's nothing left to cry about, uh, which will be true on the new earth. I'll see. I, got it. I didn't look ahead honest. Uh, uh, but it's something else to no longer cry when they're still suffering on earth. Uh, going, going into the presence of Christ surely does not make us less compassionate. Yeah. So obviously, yeah, uh, if things are bad, hap bad are happening, and we are informed of it, and obviously, it w wouldn't we have compassion? Right. It reminds me of uh, no servant is greater than the master. So I mean, if Christ is going through it, there's no question that we'll probably go through it too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Amen. Okay. It says uh, we must also keep in mind that Revelation 21:4. Verse that most often quoted on the subject of sorrow. Well, uh, heaven refers specifically to the eternal heaven, the new earth. Quote, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Christ's promise of no more tears or pain comes after the end of the old earth, after the great white throne judgment, after the old order of things has passed away, and there's no more suffering on earth. I, th I think I said that before he did. <laughs> okay. Now, the intermediate heaven and the eternal heaven are not the same. Okay, before I go on, let's see who's been paying attention. Who's going to explain the difference between intermediate heaven and eternal heaven in a f very few words? Okay, intermediate heaven is heaven as it exists right now, the holding pattern, if you will, for before God, before before the end of the millennium, when God unites heaven and the physical creation together in one in one thing, and there is no more death, that, as you described earlier, no more death, no sorrow, no suffering, no anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when people think uh, right now of heaven, it's a temporary intermediate heaven between intermediate means between two places uh, what this intermediate heaven is between what two places for heaven well remember in between originally this this paradise was uh, in uh, Hades and it was separated by a gulf from from torments and right. all the people who were going to be saved were put in paradise and waiting there for Jesus to die for their sins. And then Jesus died, and he went and took them up. And now they're in this intermediate heaven. So paradise and heaven is moved to this intermediate space, and it's going to, it's going to be there until uh, after Jesus' return 
and the uh, the tribulation, the the millennium, and then he comes back and he destroys the heavens and the earth and recreates and gives us a new heaven, new earth, and heaven and earth are joined together. That will be the eternal heaven, and that's uh, so. The, what we're think, talking about right now is a totally different set of circumstances than the eternal heaven. I wonder if it's in Bolivia. Bolivia? Yeah. Uh, can anything good be in Bolivia? <laughs> well, I don't know. You know, I just think that that's a perfect spot for like the intermediate, you know, heaven there. You know, I just think what, what is what is Bolivia like? Um, what what was the line in the scriptures? You took that rare scripture that says, "Can anything good come out of was it Gal?" Yeah. Can anything good come out of Bolivia? What, what? Yeah. I've never been to Bolivia, but is there something I don't know about Bolivia? It must be pretty good because I know Butch, Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid were going there. Okay. Okay. So the the intermediate heaven and the eternal heaven are not the same. We can be assured there will be no sorrow on the new earth, our eternal home. But though the intermediate heaven is a far happier place than earth under the curse, scripture doesn't state there can be no sorrow there. At the same time, people in heaven are not frail beings who, whose joy can only be preserved by shielding them from what's really going on in the universe. That's an interesting point. Happiness in heaven is not based on ignorance but on perspective. Those who live in the presence of Christ find great joy in worshiping God and living as righteous beings in rich fellowship in a sinless environment. And because God is continuously at work on earth, the saints watching from heaven have a great deal to praise him for, including God's drawing people on earth to himself. But those in the present heaven are also looking forward to Christ's return, their bodily resurrection, the final judgment, and the fashioning of the new earth from the ruins of the old, only then and there in our eternal home will all evil and suffering and sorrow be washed away by the hand of God. Only then and there will we experience the fullness of joy intended by God and purchased for us by Christ at an unfathomable cost. They have a major perspective, though. You yeah. see, you got to realize that they're there now. Everything mm -hmm. that we're living in, we're living by faith. Things not seen that we hope for, that 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 we have confidence in, but we haven't. We're not there. From where we, if I was up there, that would mean that everything that I went through down here is done, and and, and the fruition of all of what I can't see is fulfilled. That's going to give me a, a whole huge different perspective on everything. You know. It, it's almost like like being uh, stranded in the ocean and then finding the seashore. You know, I mean, uh, you're you're going to you're going to rejoice because you know that everything that you prayed about, everything that you hoped for, has not only come to pass, but you're there in the presence of God and watching over what's happening on earth. Sure, there might be emotional problems, but hey, you're there. You see it. It's real to you. That's got to be a huge. That, that's got to be huge helper to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think both of those are very good uh, reasons uh, for us to understand this. How we can deal with the sorrow in this intermediate heaven. One is that hey, we're there. We, we, we there, there's no faith in heaven, is there? They don't have faith because they have knowledge. There's no need there's, for it. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's no there's no need it's, for it's, faith. It's, They're it's right with God with God. <laughs> Jesus, the angel, all that stuff, they're there. They don't need to have faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not things seen. seen. They're there, uh, so they don't need to walk by faith. Uh, they walk by sight. And uh, the other thing, of course, is perspective. I mean, how if you are just in bliss, and then you have to you have to have times of sadness because you see what's what's happening on as these things are playing out, and you're sad for for people and events. Uh, but the pers in perspective, how could you ever lose your joy because the the, the the joy is so great? And there and there may be a a limit to what we know. Um, you know, there 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 may be a limit to what we're allowed to to realize. 
I mean, that's you know, we can't be dogmatic about it. It's 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 just not revealed. It's 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 revealed in scripture that we will know because of the way the saints are acting in heaven during the tribulation, the things that they're appealing to God for certain things to happen. So clearly, they're yeah. aware of what's going on. But the the question becomes, what to what level? And that's impossible for us to know. We just don't know. Yeah. Going back to Bolivia, you know, if if I if I had a, a vineyard in Bolivia perpetually in the mountains and it oh and it had flowers everywhere I had servants doing everything I needed to do most of my family's there but but some of them are still stuck in New Jersey and I know what's going on in New Jersey I might be upset over a lot of things that are happening but I'm still sitting there in paradise you know it, it is a different perspective you know it really is different yeah yeah so uh, we, we will feel compassion but as you said, we're we're going to be in such exhilaration that uh, uh, you know how could that take away this this joy this this uh, there's another word like joy uh, that I've used before uh, hmm well whatever joy is on steroids that's what we have <laughs> and if, if we're in this state of bl oh bliss. bliss so we're in bliss. We're in bliss and joy, and that you get reports of something. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, and I, I think it's a good point, Eric, too, that even though scriptures tell us that certain events are, um, in, people are informed of certain events, it doesn't mean that they're constantly uh, informed every day, every minute of the day there's a report of something bad happening on earth. Uh, that might be a, a, a problem then. But uh, to be informed on some of the main events and know things are about to happen and stuff, then uh, I don't think that's going to really affect us, even though we will feel compassion and maybe maybe shed some tears for some of the things going on on Earth. So he, his uh, conclusion here in this uh, chapter is, uh, Meanwhile, we on this dying Earth can relax and rejoice for our loved ones who are in the presence of Christ. As the Apostle Paul tells us, though we naturally grieve at losing loved ones, we are not, quote, to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope, unquote. That's 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Our parting is not the end of our relationship, only an interruption. We have not, quote, lost them because we know where they are. They are experiencing the joy of Christ's presence in a place so wonderful that Christ called it paradise. And one day we're told in a magnificent reunion, they and we will live with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17 and 18. Hmm. Yeah. So um, I think uh, I'll allow a little bit of time for us to discuss, kind of rehash the things we've discussed and make our final remarks here before we go on to this chapter 8. Uh, let me see. By the way, it looks like we're probably about uh, one, one eighth. Well, let me see. Page 80. There's, we're roughly page 80, and there's roughly... 500 pages, so you can see that we 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 have probably um, you know one seventh one eighth of the way through. So it's going to take us a long time, and um, I hope that people who watch this can appreciate uh, learning about heaven, what we have to look forward to, and understanding it. For me, I can't think of a topic that's more exciting than this. And you know, in my ministry and in on YouTube and apart from YouTube, my ministry is been um, probably 98% of my ministry has been evangelism and I believe it's the most important uh, thing that we can do while we're here uh, on earth as, as saints but um, uh, even though it's important uh, what topic what subject is more wonderful to dwell on to think about and uh, uh, I find it really sad that uh, the church has neglected this so much, and even people that uh, you know we've we encountered in the studies, we're finding that some, there are some people 
that are bewildered by how could you talk so much and so long about heaven? And I, I say, we've only scratched the surface, but why would you not want to talk day after day, moment after moment? I would love to always be talking about heaven. And I think you're going to win a lot more souls telling them about what they have to look forward to in intermediate heaven and in the eternal heaven. If they understand that, they're much more likely to be drawn to Christ and want to have that than, than if we remain ignorant of heaven. Because the church as a whole is really very, very ignorant of all the things we're discussing about. So uh, uh, it's open to discuss anything, recap anything that we covered today, uh, or... Uh, or make any any like conclusions. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and volunteer to start off, um, because I want to roll off of what you were just saying. You know, if if you again keep the 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 principle of keep it simple, okay. When you when you go to a place like say you go to a place for vacation a place you've never been before like the Cayman Islands or something like that and you go to this place it's just your idea of paradise it's tropical it's you know the perfect temperatures the water is like swimming in a swimming pool uh, there's all these great things to experience the, the 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 sea life the 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 life on the island the different foods the different things like that. And you go and you describe all these things to people after you've gone there, and you tell them, this is a great place I went, da, 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 da. and you tell them all, and you take all this time telling them about your great vacation, this wonderful place. What's the reaction you normally get? The reaction you normally get is, where? Where is this place? How do I get to this place? How did you find out about this place? How, how did you – what are the steps you took to get to this place? You know, isn't that kind of the whole point? I mean, yeah, we want to talk about how to get to heaven, but the idea of talking about heaven and and making heaven something tangible, something real, that you can be excited about is what this is all about. It, it's about putting something together which makes people listen to this and go, hey, I'm intrigued. I want to know more about this place. I want to go to this place. I want to experience these things. I want to share these things with people. I want to feel this way. That's what it's all about. Then we can share the next part of the message, which is, well, let me tell you how to get to this place. And then, and that's why we wrap up that way when we do these videos. So in question to people who may think, well, these videos are kind of long. Yeah, but there is, in reality, a lot of material to cover, and there really is a lot on the subject. It's just not normally covered. So that's what we're attempting to do here. So you can look back on these things, take these pieces, get excited about it, and then ask the next question. How do I go to this place? I want to go to this place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, we have not neglected the subject of hell. You know, we've talked about it. Um, I've talked about it in my own videos. We've talked about it in a group discussion. It's not like we, we've neglected that subject. But I, I believe, I'm more convinced now than I've ever been before that uh, it's like you attract more with sugar or with honey than you do with vinegar or something. And, and you know, the, sure, some people are want to get saved because they want to, uh, afraid of hell, okay? That's fine. That's, that's perfectly acceptable motivation if that's, if that's the way someone looks at it. But what attracted me to Christ was the love of Christ and these promises of, of eternal life in heaven. That's what attracted to me. And the more people know about the, all these promises of it, in it, that we'll have to enjoy in eternity, uh, then the, the question, the obvious question is, well, I want that. People, Most people don't want to go to heaven because they have no clue what it is, and they think it's just some, some boring ethereal place where you're a spirit. They don't understand. If they really understand the reality of what we will have in eternity, the new heaven, the new earth, what we have to look forward to, then they're going to be excited about it, say, yeah, I want that. Well, how do I get it? Through Jesus Christ. Okay, so uh, everybody else's reaction to, to, to that point and anything else. Now, remember, today we talked about we're going to have memories in heaven, we're going to have some knowledge in heaven about events going on in, on earth, okay? And uh, we may even have some sorrow in the intermediate heaven or uh, grieving uh, some from, from times, but obviously our joy is going to be beyond our, our comprehension too. All right, I'll go, Brother Luke. Okay. Uh, I think what people do is they miss up, they mess up the concept of, of heaven and the fact that too many people try to make heaven here. That too many people try to make heaven on earth when in reality heaven won't be in here. They try to make their own their own heaven and 
in their minds, and they always fall short of it. You know, they can never keep it, or it gets taken away from them, or something happens to where, you know, they lose. Sorry, something they lose something that they thought they could keep. But uh, here you always have it taken away, or it always will change. Nothing will always stay. Well, that's the good thing about Jesus Christ. He's the same forever. He's the same in the beginning, past, present, and future. He, he never changes. So I understand that it's a, it's a wonderful concept that we need to actually improve uh, the entire community on getting people to talk more about heaven, and also the fact that uh, to lay off on other subjects that you know, maybe don't need all that clarification on them. I understand there's importance to discuss them, but and how people go in depth with them and they base their entire ministry and preaching off of it is just it's silliness. It it, it doesn't do anything good but stir up trouble, cause issues, cause fights, cause divisions, you know, it did not didn't get anywhere. So I absolutely agree and this is a wonderful teaching. And I'm glad that we can continue to do this for quite some time. And uh I'll leave it on a verse of the day. I like this, and it's just uh, while we're here in the on on Earth, it's one First Peter five seven, and it says, "Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you." So stop your worrying and stop the, stop having you know to think about to do everything on your own because we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Philippians four thirteen. So we can we don't have to worry. He didn't make it to be a stressful, worryful place. He made it to where He'll carry the load for us. Just let us go into His rest. Mm-hmm. Okay. Amen. How about Mitch? I think I think it's something that you should muse about. I think God made it a mystery for us to muse about it. So even though we're a little facetious and we might be off the mark, the truth is is that, that it's a mystery. It's not shown to us. It's like there's a gift under the Christmas tree. Okay? There's something there. We don't know what it is. We don't know how good it is. And a lot of times we open up a gift and we're disappointed with it. But we can use all we want. And we are never in our wildest imagination going to really know how good this gift is in heaven. Mm. I, I can imagine the surprise parties that are going to happen up there. You know, you get up there, you know, Jesus brings you in or something like that. You sit down and all of a sudden, surprise! Who is it? Uncle Louie, what's going on? Hey, you know, I haven't seen you in years when you had that heart attack. Oh, man, I, I, I was, you know, I was hurting for you really bad. Yeah, well, I saw what you were going through with your wife back then and uh, what happened with this. And you know what? It's all good. We're just going to watch what's going on, and God is going to be with us. We're going to pray for our family. I know you miss them. But hey, you're here, and and this is this is your great grandfather. You never met this guy. Check this guy out over here. This, this is your great this is your great grandfather Ramon. How do you like it? He he speaks Italian, but he speaks English too. He's from Italy. He he's gonna tell you about your grandfather, your father. I'm like, you know, imagine all the stuff that you're gonna be surprised with, and you should muse about these things. I think that we should think about them constantly. I'm gonna make a whole show on it. You know, different ways of, of, of perspectives of things that happen when you go to heaven. Oh, my car goes off a cliff. I wake up and I'm like, oh, what's going on? I hit the lottery. Oh, what's going on? What's happening? And all of a sudden, little by little, it starts to dawn on me that I'm meeting people that I haven't seen that have been dead for years. And then all of a sudden, surprise, you know, and Jesus is there. I mean, I could just write a million different things. And I really don't care if they're on the mark or not on the mark. But I'm going to muse about it just like the two men on the road to Amas. Because this is where we should dwell. We should be thinking of the holy city. Mm -hmm. Amen. Wow. Got me excited about it, brother. Yeah. I, uh, the, more, the more we talk about this, the more we enjoy this speculation, musing, uh, and, and of course scripture does tell us a lot so I think we can really learn a lot from the scriptures about what we have to look forward to we may, we're probably not going to be uh, close to 100% right but uh, uh, we, we, we don't have to be ignorant of it we can learn the truth from the scriptures uh, but the more we do dwell on that uh, you're just going to have a much happier state of mind all the time uh, really, if you, if you want to have joy in this world, just keep on thinking about what we have to look forward to in heaven, and uh, 
Uh, I think the church is greatly lacking there, and everybody's joy would just be shooting up, you know, multiples of if they would just think on heaven and think on that instead of you know the, the worries of this world. Sister Tiffany. You still Maybe. there, Tiffany? Oh, there's Tiffany? Sister Tiffany, you're going to make any final remarks? She said she fell asleep last time we were talking, right, remember? <laughs> I can't believe she fell asleep on all of that. <laughs> Too much excitement. Okay. Um, Austin? Yeah. Uh, we're going to close the show now, but, you know, we don't want to ever uh, uh, end a broadcast without telling someone how uh, what they must do so that they can have eternal life in heaven. Uh, so uh, if some if someone's watching now and they want to say, they say, well, okay, this all sounds really good. I'm excited about heaven now. What do I have to do so I can go to heaven? Would you tell them? Absolutely. Uh, it's based upon a soul founding aspect of faith alone and once we understand that uh, the word faith, believe and trust all mean the same thing and uh, Jesus Christ said in the most simplest of verses in John 647 he said verily verily I say unto you he that believeth upon me hath everlasting life it's your complete trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ uh, work at the cross for he died for all your sins past present future and he took that all, and he bared it all on the cross for you out of love, and he finished it. And if you would believe upon that finished work entirely by faith alone, you'll be saved forever. And you can never lose that salvation. It is forever because uh, it's everlasting. If it wasn't everlasting, it wouldn't be uh, everlasting salvation. There's also a point that it's a free gift. There's nothing you can do to earn this or to keep this. If you didn't do anything to earn it in the first place, there's nothing you can do to lose it in the last place. So it's a free gift out of love, and he paid it in full. Won't you come, please, and accept it? Uh, it's always there. But today is the day of salvation because, as we all know, we can't predict the future. and We don't know what uh, time will hold. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, very well said, brother. Uh, so, uh, you know, basically, we're, we're not asking anybody to join a religion or become a religious person or follow some set of religious rules. Uh, you don't have to work. Uh, your way to heaven. In fact, you cannot work your way to heaven. It's impossible. There's only one way to get to heaven, and it's just what Brother Austin said. You believe on Jesus. You depend on him completely. Just accept the fact that you're helpless. You can't get to heaven through any other way. There's nothing you can do, and you need Jesus. He is God Almighty. He became a man. He, he did it so he could die for our sins. So now he paid for all our sins. Sin's not an issue for between man and God anymore. He paid for your sins. If you didn't know that, you should be happy for that reason alone. Jesus paid for all your sins. And he raised himself from the dead to prove he has power over life and death. So you can trust him. He is God. He proved it. He raised himself from the dead. So he can give you life everlasting, and he will. He offers it to you right now. It's a free gift. That means there's no strings attached. You don't have to work for it. You can't. Uh, you, you can't. You don't have to buy it. In fact, he bought it for you. Scripture says he paid for it with his own blood. He paid for the gift of eternal life for you by dying for your sins, and he gives it to you. He's offering it to you right now. All you got to do is reject everything else and instead put your faith completely on Christ for your salvation. Will you do it? If you do, please make a comment uh, on the video and let us know. And if you do, guess what? If you do it right now, all the saints and angels in heaven right now are having a big party celebrating that you received eternal life in the new heavens and the new earth. It's a promise from Jesus Christ. You can trust it. And uh, if you put it in the comment, they will know too. And we, we want to celebrate with you too. So I want to thank all the panelists uh, for, for joining me. I really look forward to all this. This is uh, We're just scratching the surface on heaven. Uh, Randy Alcorn's book is, has probably another hundred questions about heaven that he attempts to answer. So it's going to be exciting to go through it all. Uh, so I'll end the live broadcast, and if you guys can stick by for just a couple of minutes, I'm going to talk to you after the show is over, okay? So everybody who's watching now, bless you all in the name of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ. <laughs>